All right, well, let's get started. Uh, welcome. My name is Dan Jolene with the Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar on the Federal Highway Administration Guidance for Pedestrian or Bicycle and Pedestrian Planning Program and Project Development. Um, we're going to hear soon from a panel from FHWA. Uh, they have a lot to share with you. Before we do that, I'd just like to share a few housekeeping items with you. Um, as attendees, we'd encourage you to submit questions to us uh, whenever you have them. We are holding a period of time following the presentation for a discussion with our panelists. So we'll answer your questions then, as many as we can get to. Uh, we um, will encourage you to look for an email from us later uh, with links to the webinar archive page that will have a link to the slides as well as a recording of the webinar. And later we will also share a link to a place where you can prepare and, and share some follow-up and feedback information with us on the webinar. After you do that, you'll be able to generate a certificate of attendance for this webinar today. Um, without any further delay, uh, I'll hand things over to Bernadette DuPont with the Federal Highway Administration to go ahead and get us started. Thank you, Dan. Um, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning if it's still uh, Eastern or Western time. Um, I work in the Federal Highway Office of Human Environment, and I'm going to be the facilitator for the webinar. Uh, today, we're lucky as we have some internationally recognized experts uh, presenting today. And in order of appearance, they're listed on your screen. Um, Sherry Schaffline, Elizabeth Hilton, Darren Buck, Barbara McCann, Mark Frost, Christopher Dowes, and Daniel Blackshear. Um, our, if you check the chat pod, um, Dan has put in a link uh, to the guidance itself, and we encourage you to open it and download the guidance and to follow along as we have the, uh, do our presentation. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a standard disclaimer for federal highways and a similar disclaimer is on page one of the guidance. Uh, now we're going to have a quick poll question and we're only going to have one today because we have a lot of information to share with you. So the poll question is, what type of uh, organization or entity do you belong to? And if you can go through and look, look at those, uh, we have the local government, MPO or RPO, State agency, federal agency, or a private consultant. And I must say, we're very happy to have so many people joining us today. That's very encouraging to see everyone's interest in uh, active transportation. Okay, if you can see now, um, the almost a tie between local government and state agencies. Uh, 27% with local government, 26% with state agencies, and private consultants are 16%, MPOs 15%, and the federal agency is six. So, all right, can we have the next slide, please? We're gonna share the results of that, that poll question. And, we are going to, the purpose of the webinar today is to provide information and guidance on the federal legislation, policies and references uh, and reference materials related to bicycle, pedestrian and shared micromobility programs and projects. We also wanna highlight changes that were made in the Infrastructure uh, Investment and Jobs Act, also known as Bill, uh, as it is expanded, uh, there's funding opportunities that have uh, been increased, promoting complete streets policies and eligibility related to biking and walking has been expanded. So this slide describes the major topics in the guidance. Um, I'm now going to introduce Sherry Schaffline, who will give us a overview of Federal Highways policies on safety, accessibility, equity, and other agency goals. Sherry? Thanks, Bernadette. Yeah. Um, my name's Sherry Schaffline, and I was responsible, my office, for issuing the guidance. And I want to take this opportunity to thank my staff and those subject matter experts from other offices who helped us uh, uh, in developing the guidance. And in particular, I want to thank Christopher Dowes for coordinating all the input in the midst of what you can imagine has been a a uh, very busy time at our agency trying to implement all the new programs and administration priorities. 
Um, by virtue of the large numbers for this webinar, I wanna thank each one of you for building your competency to help our country build out a safe, accessible, comfortable, and equitable bicycle and pedestrian network. This guidance incorporates uh, Federal Highway's eight policy principles on using uh, the bipartisan in infrastructure law to build a better America. Uh, and this is found on pages four through eight of the guidance as you're following along. I'll provide a quick overview and then some a few details on each of these policies uh, in the next few slides. You will have seen all of these policy areas incorporated in any new guidance coming out of federal highways or any of our new discretionary grant uh, notice of funding opportunities. First of all, we wanna prioritize safety in all investments and projects. We are teeing off a tremendous amount of work and commitments and guidance that the agency has been promoting through the National Roadway Safety Strategy and the Safe System Approach. With regard to complete streets, we've been encouraging states and communities to adopt and implement complete streets policies that prioritize the safety of all users in the transportation network, uh, planning, design, construction, and operations. As we know, complete networks need to include access to transit. We want to make states aware that they may transfer funds for eligible projects that support transit. And in light of all the significant increase in apportion funding and the considerable funding for new programs, uh, we're hoping that states will reconsider moving funds between programs. The ADA is civil rights legislation. Our transportation networks need to be accessible for all. Equity means that everybody has an opportunity according to their abilities and gaps in the network are addressed so people can access essential services and places. And we all know that biking and walking are the cleanest forms of human transportation. Our ability to mode shift towards biking and walking uh, will really help improve our environment and promote sustainable and livable communities. And finally, as we make these investments, pedestrian and bicycle projects provide more employment opportunities than major transportation projects because they're often more labor intensive. Bike and ped projects are also ideal training for our future uh, transportation workforce through Qualified Youth Service and Conservation Corps. Let's look at these a little bit uh, more in detail. Next slide. The reason we need to prioritize safety in all investments and projects is the number of ped and bike fatalities uh, were declining until 2009, but numbers are increasing since then. This guidance is part of the solution for providing safe and accessible pedestrian and bicycle networks for all ages. Unfortunately, NHTSA's preliminary number for last year for combined fatalities is up to 7,345 humans uh, that have died. Next slide. We are two years into populating content for our Complete Streets website uh, with more resources to come to aid the implementation of Complete Streets policies that prioritize the safety of all users, as I said, in transportation network planning, design, construction, and operations. So uh, please take advantage of all these resources as you're uh, thinking about your projects and working in your community. Next slide. The portion of the, this portion of the guidance is about moving money from one program to another. Know that there are criteria and eligibilities for doing so. We do encourage transfer of funds for eligible projects from any federal aid category to the FTA for an eligible project that may be administered more effectively as a transit project. For transferability between FHWA programs, given the high demand and need for for bike ped projects, we're really asking state DOTs to rethink their need for transfers given all the new and increased funding that are available in so many other uh, programs. But keep in mind, for example, in transportation alternatives, bill established requirements that states must meet before they transfer funds out. 
I do want to point out, because we had a number of questions on this issue, that although it's not discussed in the guidance, uh, a misconception is that the, the transportation alternative transfer restriction only affects transfers to other federal aid apportion programs. States that select TA projects through a competitive process may transfer funds to other federal agencies to administer the project, such as uh, transfers to F FTA, FRA, uh, Department of Interior or Agriculture Agencies or the Army Corps. Okay, next slide. So folks have been trying to bring our legacy transportation systems into ADA compliance for decades. ADA is emphasized here as a policy priority so we don't miss any opportunity with bill funding to ensure the accessibility of pedestrian facilities in the public right of way through, for example, curb ramps, sidewalks, crosswalks, pedestrian signals, and access to transit stops. Equity means that everybody has an opportunity according to their abilities. As this graphic image shows, providing the same bicycle to everybody doesn't recognize that people have different transportation needs. Only one of the four folks in the top row can really use a standard bike. In the bottom row, each person has an appropriately designed cycle, whether it be a hand cycle, standard bicycle, adult tricycle, or children's size bicycle. Providing a correctly sized cycle, or in a larger sense, transportation facilities that best serve individual needs gives everybody an opportunity to participate in society and thrive. And as we know, bicycling and walking are the cleanest forms of transportation and will really help us move forward uh, in a sustainable way. And there are lots of opportunities to, through more funding that's available uh, for new programs uh, in this regard. And finally, with the labor and workforce, um, uh, please know that these projects are ideal for training our future transportation workforce. And Christopher will go into more detail on this with another slide later. So I'll pass it on now to um, Elizabeth. Oh, no, I think we're moving to our right. conversation, right? Yeah, it's Bernadette again. Um, as we're updating our guidance, many partners or many of you out there ask for more information about the meaning of due consideration. Uh, the law uses the term, but doesn't define it. And then of course, federal highways report to Congress on moving to a complete streets design model also identified the need to provide guidance on the meaning of due consideration. So right now in the guidance, if you go over, we're looking at pages eight through 11, and they'll provide more detail than our previous guidance did, guidance has. Uh, but we're gonna have a short panel discussion um, on what due consideration means to you. So we're gonna introduce Darren Buck, Elizabeth Hilton, and Barbara McCann, and um, we're gonna turn it over to Elizabeth now. Uh, so you can talk about facility need. Thanks, Bernadette. Regarding facility need, our role as engineers is to protect the public health, safety, and welfare of the public, regardless of what mode of transportation people use. Due consideration means performing a serious and thoughtful review of the project context to determine what facilities are needed to provide safe, accessible, comfortable, equitable and interconnected networks for bicycling and walking. We need to start by looking at current land use and the anticipated changes to that land use over time. Does that land use suggest that trips could be served by various modes? If so, we need to provide facilities for those modes because people will make those trips even without facilities, and that might be risky. Is the roadway used by public transportation? If so, we need safe walking and bicycling facilities to access the transit stops. We should review a variety of planning documents listed in the guidance to inform our understanding of the project context. When we're thinking about what kind of modal facilities to provide, we need to think about anticipated traffic growth and work to eliminate conflicts with other users. This is consistent with the safe system approach. I'll turn it over to Darren. I think he's next. All right. Thank you. Um, network connectivity may sound a little complex, um, but at its core, 
It's about not losing sight of the fact that walking, bicycling, and rolling is transportation. And while many of those trips may be for a recreational purpose taken for the sake of simply taking them, many of them are also to get someone somewhere, to get to and from the places people want to need to go. System owners should think critically and with foresight about what those origins and destinations are, both the quality and safety of the network links that connect them, and plan for making the really high value connections that will make walking and bicycling and rolling more usable, more comfortable, more safe, and more equitable. We would not plan and construct an interstate highway with northbound but no southbound lanes, but too often we expect people walking, bicycling, rolling to either accept and adapt to analogous and complete networks in their communities or to not participate in those activities at all. We especially ask them to accept unacceptable safety and comfort compromises on higher speed non-freeway arterials and arterials that may serve as main streets through our rural small towns. So as Elizabeth, Elizabeth talked about providing uh, due consideration for facility needs on a particular project, and Barbara is going to talk about uh, the safe systems and complete streets approach to ensuring the safety of all users on a project, we have to leave space to emphasize planning for where facilities are needed to make new walking, bicycling, and rolling connections and ensure that our definition of safety is very explicitly considering where people do not walk, bike, or roll because they feel unsafe as a safety problem that degrades the quality and usefulness of the network. I'll pass on to Barbara. Sorry, I am unmuted now. Um, thank you, Darren. The, the On the safety side, it's really, the, the safety is such a fundamental consideration um, for pedestrians and bicyclists because of what Darren and Elizabeth just talked about is that you don't, when you're traveling this way, you don't have an airbag, you don't have a steel frame surrounding you. You're really uh, expecting the infrastructure to help keep you safe. And so you must have it, it must be there. Um, and rather than being prescriptive about what a safe facility is, Federal Highways is really encouraging a, a look at safety that's really around a, a number of principles that we've pulled together called the Complete Streets Design Model. And this design model includes being sure to set appropriate speeds and build for, design for appropriate speeds, to separate users in time and space, especially as speeds get higher, to ensure connectivity, as Darren just mentioned, uh, and then also to use safety countermeasures when you identify a safety problem. Uh, and we have uh, many tools in order to help with safety assessments to really pinpoint where problems are and uh, fix those problems. We're going to hear about in a few, a little bit in a few minutes. Uh, we have new requirements around having uh, every state is doing a safety assessment and around uh, spending. Uh, HSIP funding on safety. So there's lots, there's resources for how to do this and how to really pay attention uh, to safety uh, as a really a fundamental part of, uh, of your due consideration on all projects, not only ped bike projects, but really all projects. And I actually I had, I think we're having a conversation here. I was going to ask you a question, Darren. Uh, can you mention a couple uh, uh, very quickly because we we have a lot going on, but but we do have resources around connectivity that I uh, we do. Uh, we actually have a, a slide where I'll mention uh, a big one that we have uh, our guidebook for measuring multimodal network connectivity. Um, we also, uh, I will say up on our report, we, uh, we had a pilot grant program a couple of years ago where we provided grants to uh, agencies to conduct uh, network connectivity analyses for both walking and bicycling in their communities. Those are great examples of the types of projects that We'd love to see more communities doing to integrate um, both their um, their sort of safety considerations uh, of planning and networks to come up with integrated networks that uh, serve um, uh, serve the entire community. Uh, I will also give folks a, a, a preview to look out uh, for upcoming uh, discretionary grant opportunities through the Active Transportation Infrastructure Investment Program, which uh, is uh, is uh, the mission of which is to um, allow communities to plant and construct uh, networks uh, for walking, bicycling, and rolling. Darren, I really yeah, like that you that you brought up um, 
your highway example that we wouldn't build a street and leave gaps in the route or build the northbound and not the southbound and we shouldn't do that with bicycling or walking facilities mm -hmm. either i re yeah. really appreciate you bringing that up yes and also also the uh concept that it's, it's not only looking at who's already out walking uh it may be not too many people are because it's an unattractive environment it's really about looking at that context so mm -hmm. There's data analysis around safety about looking at crashes and um, and and that that information. We really promote that, but also looking at that land use and looking at well, you know, there's a grocery store on one side and an apartment on the other. Um, we we need uh, we need a crossing here. That's just one really pretty simple example. And, and I, I would that... since you mentioned uh, Darren, you mentioned grant programs. I I would be remiss if I didn't mention our big new grant program, Safe Streets and Roads for All. Uh, which is has great funding for both planning and for constructing facilities uh, can really help fill some gaps for people. And I think when we're considering networks, when we're considering facility need, and when we're considering safety, um, we talk a lot about considering all users. Um, and I think it goes back to sort of the equity uh, explanation that Sherry was giving that all users don't have uniform require or requirements from their facility. and how we define that network, um, we have to be careful about considering the quality and how many actual users that network serves. So somebody uh, somebody who is walking with a particular type of disability, uh, that network is effectively truncated uh, if with a single uh, accessibility gap, um, it uh, the network may be incomplete for somebody uh, with a bicycle uh, that uh, they, they simply don't feel comfortable uh, in a narrow facility or close to traffic. Um, so it, it really does scale um, when we start thinking about the people who have to make use of them. Yeah, Elizabeth, do you have any? Oh, are we out of time? Well, I won't, no, we have uh, time for one more question. You're going to ask Elizabeth, and I was just going to say. Just, okay, I was just going to ask Elizabeth, uh, since Darren brought up the um, issue of, uh, of people with disabilities. We also have people with vision impairment. If, you know, that's something you've worked on quite a bit um, as in terms of consideration. How do you how do you see that fitting into the consideration conversation? Well, I think, you know, under the ADA, we have to think about any change we're making to the roadway, how that's going to impact people with a variety of abilities. And people with disabilities, um, I think over the last 20 years, we've gotten better about thinking about people with mobility disabilities who use wheelchairs or crutches or canes, but we haven't made enough progress in thinking about how people with who are blind or have low vision travel in our complicated rights of way and how they decide when to cross a street. Uh, um, without traffic control or, or with traffic control in the absence of something like accessible pedestrian signals. So we really have to think about how some of these uh, changes we're making to the street are going to be used uh, by people with a variety of abilities. It's so important to think about that up front. You can't engineer in um, you know, accessibility on the back end. We really have to think about it on the front end. And I think increasingly, um... I, I'm learning more every day about uh, the different travel needs of people with neurodivergence. Um, and another another challenge I, I face day to day is is traveling with a six year old. Uh, children have have extremely uh, unique travel needs, um, and uh, implementing that uh, implementing networks in practice that make walking and bicycling safer for for that cohort of a population is uh, is is critically important. Yeah, good point. And we've all been children <laughs> at one point. <laughs> but, but we want to thank you for that uh, panel discussion. It was uh, brief, but you got a lot of good information out there. And we thank you all for that. Thank you. Um, and if you, just for those people who are following along, due consideration is discussed on pages 8 to 11. Uh, and now we're going to invite uh, Matt Frost to discuss the planning section of the guidance, uh, which begins on page 11. Matt? Uh -huh. Right. Thank you for that. So again, Mac Frost from the Office of Planning. So we'll be discussing the statutory and regulatory planning requirements 
And it's, if you're following along, that's on uh, page 11 of the guidance. So we really today just wanted to summarize a few key points. We're not going to go into detail on all of these, but the two major ones we wanted to follow up on is related to due consideration and integrated management. So as far as due consideration in our law, 23 USC 217, bicycles and pedestrians shall be given due consideration in the comprehensive transportation plans developed by metropolitan planning organizations, or MPOs, and the state in accordance with our planning laws. And our planning law comes from 23 USC 134 and 135 respectively for statewide and metropolitan planning. And so those bicycle transportation facilities and pedestrian walkways, and the law says, shall be considered where appropriate in conjunction with all new construction and reconstruction of transportation facilities, except where bicyclist and pedestrian use is not permitted. So the important part of that is that they shall be considered in conjunction with new construction and reconstruction of transportation facilities. And then further, furthermore, our planning regulations, so the regulations that implement the law, it defines consideration as one or more parties taking into account the op opinions, action, and relevant information from other parties and making the decision or determining a course of action. And then as far as integrated management, we highlight the importance of integrated management, integrated plans. So the long run metropolitan plan, as well as the statewide transportation plans, as well as the transportation improvement programs. You may have heard these referred to as STIPs and TIPs. So these plans have to provide for the development and integrated management and operation of transportation systems and facilities. And these include accessible pedestrian walkways, bicycle transportation facilities, and intermodal facilities. So that's just a few of the statutory and regulatory requirements that we wanted to highlight that is existing planning law. A lot of this existing law and regulation has been in place for 30 more years. Um, and on the next slide, we wanted to highlight a, a few new items. So specifically related to complete streets. So now we're focusing on, if you're following along, this is page 13 of the guidance. So Bill, our law includes significant new provisions to support pedestrian bicycle safety access. So it requires that each state use 2.5% of its state planning research funds, SPR funds, as well as each MPO to use 2.5% of its metropolitan planning funds, PL funds. So they have to use 2.5% of their PL and SPR funds on activities to increase safe and accessible pedestrian options for multiple travel modes of people of all ages and abilities. So again, this can include the adoption of policies or any standards to prioritize the safety of all users in transportation projects and developing plannings. And we also have a waiver of non-federal share. So FHWA and FTA have waived the standard 20% non-federal share when using these funds. And bill also includes the new definition of a road user. It also also defines vulnerable road users as, as bicyclists and pedestrians. And just to highlight the term road user means a motorist, passenger, public transportation operator or user, truck driver, bicyclist, motorcyclist, or pedestrian, including a person with disabilities. So this has been codified in law, uh, 23 USC 148. And then the number of notable the number of non-motorized fatalities and non-motorized serious injuries are also among the performance measures under the National Performance Management Measures for HSIP. And this performance measure and the vulnerable road user special rule, well, I'll describe it a little bit below, but this may also impact the use of HSIP, Highway Safety Improvement Program funds, and the implementation of safe, accessible, equity and comfortable bike and pedestrian networks can help with safety performance. And then following up on safety, so in the safety section, bill requires all states to conduct a detailed assessment of vulnerable road user safety. And these are due to be completed this upcoming November. And the states are required to consult with stakeholders while developing those assessments. And then Congress made a change to ensure that states with a high proportion of pedestrian and bicycle facilities are spending at least 15% of their highway safety improvement funds, their ACE funds, on pedestrian and bicycle safety projects. And this is assess assessed each year. And for 2022, this provision applies to 35 states. 
And there are a few other FHWA guidance documents that are going into more detail on the safety provisions related to pedestrian bicyclists. But for now, I want to turn it over to Sherry to discuss project development. Thanks, Mac. Our introductory paragraphs in this portion of the guidance, and we're in uh, pages 14 through 16 now, the introductory paragraphs basically summarize the statements that can be expanded upon in developing a purpose and need statement for a standalone project, a batch of projects, or one integrated into a much larger multimodal project. Practitioners that have been receiving federal aid funds for years are well aware of NEPA requirements, but for all our new and non-traditional applicants seeking funds, know that given that you're receiving federal funds, you must comply with the National Environmental Policy Act that generally requires you to identify impacts and minimize and mitigate negative environmental impacts. The documentation, review, and approvals for many beneficial bike and ped projects are streamlined. And for years, we've worked with our partners to develop accelerated project delivery tools and strategies. The state DOTs and division offices for Federal Highway are well-versed in recommending categorical exclusions that may apply to your project. A good place to start is reviewing the Environmental Review Toolkit. With regard to 4F, uh, by their nature, we tend to improve existing or add to walking and biking infrastructure in, around, or to parks and rec areas, refuges, and historic sites. To protect these resources, there's additional guidance uh, that we reference. Um, and that you must follow, but also note there are many exceptions for approvals, and two are noted here, but there are several others associated with uh, bike and pedestrian projects. This short list on the other column of other considerations is to get practitioners to pause and ask a few questions on contemporary issues. Are we future-proofing our corridors and areas that are accommodating kind of smart projects or automated vehicles? Uh, have project teams involved the folks responsible for implementing local land use and parks plans to ensure that mutual benefits can accrue? And are you sure your meaningful public involvement efforts are responsive to the non-discrimination goals of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act? And finally, remember that infrastructure funding was increased not only for federal highways and USDOT, but for many other federal agencies. Are there synergies that can be had by coordinating projects to improve co-benefits. I'll pass it back to Elizabeth now. Okay, thanks, Sherry. On page 16 of the guidance, it's, there's some discussion about preliminary engineering and design. So next, uh, next slide, please. The guidance reiterates the federal requirements in both law and regulation that we need to be aware of when we're scoping projects and during the preliminary engineering and design phases. These are outlined in the guidance. For example, right-of-way acquisition for bikeways and pedestrian walkways is permitted as part of highway projects. FHWA cannot approve projects that have a significant adverse impact on the safety for non-motorized transportation or those that sever a major route. Railway highway crossing projects must take into account bicycle safety. The design of projects on the national highway system, other than the interstate, must consider access for other modes of transportation. This consideration is what we talked about earlier, a serious and thoughtful review of the project context to determine what facilities are needed for all modes. When a highway bridge deck is replaced or rehabilitated, pedestrians or bicyclists must be must generally be accommodated. So I encourage you to read through the guidance uh, in detail. There's a lot more information there. We can best accomplish the goal of providing safe and comfortable facilities for all modes by including due consideration as part of project scoping and early public involvement. We can include needed work, such as removing barriers for people with disabilities, incorporating proven safety countermeasures, reallocating roadway space, and so on as we move through the project development process. Recipients 
of federal aid for highway projects are required to maintain those facilities and maintenance is very important. As part of, um, under the DOJ regulations under Title II of the ADA, regardless of funding, features of facilities and equipment that are required to be readily accessible to and usable by persons with disabilities must be maintained in operable working condition. It's not enough to build something initially, we have to maintain it and make sure it continues to function properly. When a project has outlived its useful life, reconstruction or relocation can use federal aid funds. I'll pass the discussion now to Christopher Dallas. Thank you, Elizabeth. I am learning a whole lot and I even helped write the guidance. I'm gonna talk now about what Sherry mentioned earlier about uh, workforce development. Uh, MAP 21, section 1524, which was enacted 10 years ago, but is still in effect, talked about the use of qualified youth service and conservation corps. It encourages the Department of Transportation to, it requires the US Department of Transportation to encourage states and regional transportation agencies to use qualified youth service and conservation corps to perform appropriate transportation related projects. This provision is still in effect and we have uh, links here on the guidance page. Uh, appropriate projects can include any project eligible under transportation alternatives, under any pedestrian or bicycle project, any recreational trail project, any safe route to school project, or a scenic byway project that a core could do. And that can, it's not dependent on the funding source, it's dependent on what kind of project a core can do. So that could include some highway projects. It could include landscaping along the highways. It could include federal land projects. Youth core programs provide workforce development training for our future transportation and recreation workforce. Um, you can look at trails, for example, as maybe in some cases a mini highway that the training you learn when you do trail construction can help with your highway construction. Yeah. There are provisions in the law to sole source contracts and cooperative agreements to qualified youth service or conservation corps to perform this work. And there's organization, the core network, which represents uh, youth service conservation corps nationwide. It has resources on its trails and transportation webpage, which uh, when you download the slides, you will be able to, well, the, uh, there is a link in the guidance to these slides. I'm going to move now into my expertise, which is funding provisions. We have available a table on pedestrian and bicycle funding opportunities. Uh, this table is in the process of being updated to add two new programs and a few new activities that people have asked about. Uh, federal surface transportation law provides flexibility to states and MPOs to fund bicycle, pedestrian, micromobility, and trail projects and activities from a wide variety of programs. Bicycle and pedestrian facilities are eligible under nearly all federal aid and federal lands highways program, many US DOT discretionary programs, federal transit administration programs. When considering and evaluating ways to improve conditions for walking and bicycling, you can, among things that you are encouraged to do, integrate your pedestrian and bicycle improvements into larger projects, which is what Elizabeth and Darren and uh, Barbara all were talking about. You could use a variety of funding sources. Again, the Bicycle and Pedestrian Funding Opportunities table will have a link to a whole lot of programs. Uh, you can explore state, local, and private funding sources. You can explore private, public-private partnerships. We have available a link in the guidance that goes to Federal Highway Administration's Active Transportation Funding and Finance Toolkit. Um, on this page, uh, basically what I explained is all actually not new under the bill legislation. That's been eligible for a long time. One thing that has changed is the coordinator positions it used to be that states could use uh, funding from surface transportation block grant program or congestion mitigation and air quality improvement program to fund one state coordinator. That's now lifted to two. So that is actually a change. I'm also gonna mention thing about bridges, tunnels, culverts. 
uh, they have long lifespans. So when you're planning a bridge or a tunnel or thinking about a major highway culvert that um, might allow people to get underneath, for example, think about the future. What is the land use going to be here 50, 75, 100 years from now? Will suburbanization have extended out beyond there? Think about your emergency relief. If you're building a nice big long bridge over a river and maybe a car breaks down, how is the, pedest the car driver who's now a pedestrian going to get off the bridge? Uh, so when you do your emergency relief, think about how pedestrian bicycle facilities are part of the resilient transportation system. We actually have a document coming out soon on, well, actually, we'll discuss that later about trails as resilient infrastructure. I will also mention, keep an eye on the proven safety countermeasures. We, uh, those are known ways for uh, states, MPOs, localities to have generally very cost-effective projects that promote safety. Um, talk about funding programs. Many of these funding programs have existed for years, 30 years in case of congestion mitigation and air quality improvement program. The former transportation enhancements, now transportation alternatives, has been around for 30 years. State Highway Safety Improvement Program has been available for about 15, 20 years. Uh, the vulnerable road users section of that is new. There is a new carbon reduction program that can fund pedestrian and bicycle facilities because, as Sherry mentioned earlier, they are clean transportation. And I am going to reiterate again. Although each program has its funding eligibility, so I'm not going to go into those, but I will reiterate that Fitch WA encourages states to first consider the need to transfer funds in light of the significant increase in, in apportioned funding and the considerable funding for new programs. States that prioritize safety and accessibility for all users will ensure that projects and programs that benefit pedestrian and bicyclists receive priority when making funding decisions. This slide has a whole lot of new discretionary programs. We have the Active Transportation Infrastructure Investment Program, which Darren mentioned, which hopefully we will have a notice of funding opportunity soon. The Legacy Program is the Scenic Byways Program, but we have all these other new discretionary programs. The Reconnecting Communities Pilot Program actually has been combined with the Neighborhood Access and Equity Grant Program. It's uh, now one notice of funding opportunity that just came out last week. Uh, safe Streets and Roads for All that Barbara mentioned, or Protect Discretionary can be used for resilience projects. And I'm gonna mention the SMART Program, which we had not did not have on our table, but we do now. Uh, it can provide grants for projects such as pedestrian detection, monitoring bike racks use on buses or curb management. Other funding considerations. Um, one thing that is true for most highway projects, but is not true for pedestrian bicycle projects, most highway projects have to be using surface transportation block program funds, have to be within the right of way of a federal aid highway. That is not true for pedestrian bicycle projects. Pedestrian bicycle projects do not have location, location restrictions. You can have pedestrian bicycle projects that use the surface transportation block grant program funds, transportation alternatives, recreational trails, congestion mitigation funds, highway safety improvement program funds, or carbon reduction funds do not have to be within the right of way federal aid highway. Um, yeah. The motorized use and the e-scooters, Danielle will talk about that later. Uh, one expansion in the bipartisan infrastructure law was that education projects, non-construction projects, for pedestrians is now eligible under the Congestion Mitigation Air Quality Improvement Program and under the Surface Transportation Block Grant Program. There was new uh, language for railroad crossings programs that yes, pedestrians shall be considered. Uh, there is a little change, which is a big change in the Recreational Trails Program all recreational trail projects that use funds apportioned under the, the, basically the federal aid highway apportioned program funds, if you use those funds for a trail, 
the trail, the project shall be administered as if funded under the recreational trails program. That means that recreational trail projects, regardless of federal highway apportioned funding source, shall not be treated as a federal highway project. The states will use the same procurement procedures that they would use for state funded projects. And projects also can benefit from the same federal share flexibilities. I'm gonna mention Safe Routes to School. There is no specified funding for Safe Routes to School projects, but they are broadly eligible under a surface transportation block grant program, transportation alternative set aside. And I have not yet thought of a Safe Routes to School project that would not also be eligible under the Highway Safety Improvement Program. The big difference is that there was eligibility expanded into high school. And I also mentioned before the proven safety countermeasures. Again, anytime you have to use proven safety countermeasures, pedestrian hybrid beacons, lighting, uh, medians for pedestrians, uh, crosswalks, please consider those. Transit projects. I we met Trent, Sherry mentioned transit projects before. Transit projects can include bike racks on buses. It can include access to transit stations. We encourage states to improve pedestrian, bicycle, and trail facilities that provide access to transit. Um, and there is one item that's sort of a legacy of ancient. It's actually from 1970s legislation on transportation purpose is that uh, there is a section of law that says that a bicycle project must be principally for transportation purpose. That was from 1970s. However, since then, the Surface Transportation Block Grant Program and Transportation Alternatives and Recreational Trails all can fund recreational facilities. So the restriction on bicycles for only for transportation use does not apply to surface transportation block grant program, transportation alternatives, recreational trails. Also, that restriction only applies to bicycle projects, doesn't apply to pedestrian projects, equestrian, snowmobile, off highway vehicle, whatever. Uh, finally, I'm going to talk about federal share. And then Danielle will be after me on this, the next topic. But uh, in general, your federal share is going to be the same as for uh, whatever the main program is. So if your federal share generally is 80% in your state, that's going to be true for pedestrian bicycle projects. It depends on the funding program, not on whether the project is a pedestrian bicycle project. Um, one change in the bipartisan infrastructure law, which is sort of unfortunate, <laughs> uh, the transportation alternative set aside has a new flexibility provision which unfortunately is not as flexible as we'd hoped it would be. It does allow states to credit, the, uh, to use, it allows states to use Highway Safety Improvement Program funds to be credited toward the federal share. However, the state still may, needs to maintain its overall standard federal share, whatever that is. In most states, again, 80%. So, uh, Again, we were hoping the flexibility would be more flexible. And I already mentioned the issue with the recreational trails program. Any recreational trail, uh, even if it uses CMAC funds or STBG funds or Highway Safety Improvement Program funds, if it's a recreational trail, it can match or be matched by any other federal program. Again, this only applies to recreational trails and not to sidewalks or bike facilities on highways. And one little factoid, did you know, in-kind match has been allowed under the Federal Aid Highway Program since 1998. The T21 legislation has a, a allowed state to meet its local match for federal highway projects through donations of funds, materials, services, or right-of-way. In-kind contributions, such as volunteer labor, <laughs> land donations, and services may count toward the matching share requirement provided that a reasonable cash value can be attributed to the donated time, resource, or service. This is all mentioned in the guidance, and there's also links there to the soft match and documentation purposes. So uh, 
I am going now to move on to Danielle Blackshear to talk about shared micromobility, which is newly eligible. Awesome. Thank you so much, Christopher. Um, so just as a little bit of background, Federal Highway defines micromobility as any small, low-speed, human or electric powered transportation device. And this includes bicycles, scooters, electric assist bicycles, which we call e-bikes, uh, electric scooters or e-scooters, and any other small lightweight wheeled conveyances. Shared micromobility refers to fleets of micromobility devices that are available to the public for shared use. These devices can be stationed at a fixed dock or float in dockless systems. The bipartisan infrastructure law authorized shared micromobility projects, including bike sharing and shared scooter systems as eligible under the CMAC program. And this is outlined in 23 USC 149B7. In addition, STBG, and CMAC funds can be used for the construction of bicycle and shared micromobility transportation facilities. And this is outlined in 23 USC 217A. Uh, and just for consistency, Federal Highway does interpret this eligibility as applicable to projects using TA set aside funds. Um, eligibility for Federal Highway, but not FTA or Federal Transit Administration funds includes bicycles and scooter projects. Um, however, I just wanted to make a note that we are still addressing issues with Buy America requirements. Um, the bipartisan infrastructure law also changed the definition of an electric bicycle in 23 USC 217J2, and this modified the kinds of electric bicycles that states and local governments may use on non-motorized trails and pedestrian walkways that use federal aid funds. Um, and uh, the particular reference for that is 23 USC 217H4. Electric bicycle infrastructure is eligible under the TA set aside program. However, the bipartisan infrastructure law did not amend 23 USC uh, 217H, which lists restrictions on the types of, or sorry, lists restrictions on the use of motorized vehicles to allow other shared micromobility devices on non-motorized trails and pedestrian walkways. And if you want more information about this, uh, please reference the TA set aside project eligibility questions and answers to so the Q&A document uh, that was dated March 30th, 2022. And that's available on our Federal Highway uh, Bike Ped website. So thank you, Christopher, that is all for me. Thank you, Danielle. Um, uh, now we're going to move on to the last section of the webinar, and that's on planning and design resources that we have available and our research activities. Um, the guidance does not provide planning and design detail, but it has links to the documents that provide those details. Um, we're going to start now with uh, Elizabeth Hilton, followed by Darren Buck. Elizabeth? Thanks, Bernadette. The guidance points to many resources and we thought it would be important to explain the difference between standards, guidance, and information. Standards are adopted by regulation, and compliance is required unless there is an approved deviation. For example, the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, or the METCD, is a required standard. The 2018 AASHTO Policy on Geometric Design of Highways and Streets, commonly known as the Green Book, is the design standard for projects on the national highway system, regardless of funding source. I would note that there is a lot of flexibility in the Green Book, and it doesn't require, for example, 12 feet lanes on every roadway. So it's important for designers to read the text of the Green Book, not just pull numbers from the tables. Guidance is a statement of agency policy or interpretation concerning a statute, regulation, or technical matter within the jurisdiction of the agency that does not have the force or effect of law. And information resources provide useful technical information like case studies. Examples of information documents are shown on the screen. The Accessible Shared Streets document, for example, provides a lot of useful information on how people who are blind or have low vision travel and how we can make shared streets accessible to them. 
Darren? Sorry about that. Um, so, um, much of uh, Federal Highway's recent work in bicycle planning. Oh, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, a lot of Federal Highway's recent uh, planning and design work um, in bicycling is aimed just to get us to the point where we're accommodating uh, people's level of comfort with interacting with motor vehicles while on a bicycle. Uh, last year, we created uh, the infographic on the right uh, and distributed through Federal Highway social media. And the basic principle might be a familiar one to many of you that many more US residents want to ride a bicycle than do currently, but do not have access to facilities where they feel comfortable riding. When we provide facilities that we know are perceived as safer, we know that more people ride them more often. In the middle, uh, you'll see the cover of the Bikeway Selection Guide, a publication put out by our Office of Safety colleagues that helps agencies walk through, navigate the trade-off process and select the optimal facility to hopefully achieve that level of comfort necessary to attract all ages and ability of riders specific to the context. Uh, and on the right, the guidebook for measuring multimodal network connectivity that I mentioned earlier expands this consideration of comfort or quality of networks to pedestrians as well, and provides a framework for looking at how well a walking, bicycling, and rolling network comfortably connects pieces, people to the places they want and need to go. Where we increasingly see a need is to more deeply consider the role um, of comfort and perception of safety and encouraging more walking and rolling as we do in bicycling. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some recent and in progress research. Uh, right now, we are working to finalize a few documents around uh, crosswalk design and um, uh, guiding agencies, helping them make decisions on uh, where and uh, how often to use, uh, say, high visibility designs for crosswalks to encourage safety. Uh, we have a resource on implementing separated bike lanes on higher speed roadways. Um, where we, we hope to provide some good useful case studies and, and uh, help to agencies um, in uh, providing facilities that we know are proven to increase uh, safety in contexts where uh, we find so many uh, a disproportional number of fatalities occurring. And finally, uh, helping uh, designers uh, design for accessibility around the raft of, of newer and quick build pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure solutions that agencies are increasingly putting out. Um, we, we know that many of these may are, are difficult to uh, figure out exactly how to make them accessible. And so we wanted to, to provide some assistance uh, in helping designers. So all of those should be coming soon. Uh, we have a variety of ongoing research, especially under our complete streets umbrella, including products on performance measurement, uh, systems dynamic model of complete, complete streets implementation and much more. Uh, we also expect to be launching some other walking and bicycling specific projects in the coming years uh, or in the coming uh, fiscal year, including one that I'm particularly excited about, uh, our strategic agenda for walking and bicycling transportation update. It serves as a research roadmap for activities uh, that Federal Highway does for walking and bicycling, organizes them into sort of four main areas, uh, safety concerns, uh, networks, uh, measuring and encouraging more trips, and uh, providing equity. And so based on uh, our previous strategic agenda and an upcoming report to Congress uh, that we are prepared on what Federal Highway is planning to do in the short term to advance walking and bicycling, we hope that this plan will help answer a variety of questions around walking, bicycling, and rolling, such as how will we uh, address the tremendous need for more and better walking and bicycling data uh, that we identified in our previous complete streets report to Congress? How will achieve mode shift goals contained in the USDOT, USDOT strategic plan uh, that calls for increasing the proportion of person trips taken by sustainable modes from four to 6%? And how will make walking, bicycling, and rolling a part of overall federal government efforts to advance equity? Um, we're running short on time, so why don't we go to the next slide? Uh, recognizing the critical role that trails play in our walking, bicycling, and rolling networks, we have many trail planning and design resources available. Many are available through a long-term partnership with the U.S. Uh, Forest Service. Um, you can uh, look all of these up 
online, and I will pass it to Bernadette to kick off our Q&A session. Thank you. You notice we put a, a picture of owls on there today because they represent the wisdom that you've received today and what you already have. <laughs> but we received a lot of questions before the webinar, and hopefully we answered most of those questions in our presentation. Um, we appreciate the additional questions that we received during the session, and but we have a wide variety of competencies to accommodate, and we're monitoring, you know, the common and repeated questions that we can influence. So we have um, several that we've selected that we can answer today. Um, we just to tell you about some of the questions that we were asked before. There was a lot of questions about planning and design. Uh, most of them were too specific for this broad level guidance. However, the design resources section of the guidance uh, can lead you to the planning and design resources that may answer your questions. We also received quite a few questions about projects in rural areas. I would recommend um, that you look at the DOT Navigator webpage, and that will provide you a lot of information about that. And we appreciate the fact that there's a lot of new applicants and people that need to get up to speed on the requirements, eligibilities, and et cetera. Et cetera. And we recommend that um, you work with your state and your federal highway division office contacts for specific help. However, if you have some specific questions on the guidance document, we can answer those questions now. And we'll start with some of the ones that you already put in the website. Um, and the very first one was, uh, can Safe Routes to School, Mon and if all our um, speakers can put their cameras on now, we can go ahead and let you show your faces and answer the questions. Um, can the Safe Routes to School money be used by colleges or universities or by colleges and universities in conjunction with nearby schools? That's our very first one. Uh, Christopher, I think that's one for you, Safe Routes to School money. Okay, well, uh, his, uh, you must be on mute, but we'll go ahead and go on to the next question. Uh, do all the funding sources being discussed flow through the state DOT? But, sorry, everybody. Oh, okay. Just yeah. as I'm gonna answer the question, everything froze on me. So uh, <laughs> repeat the question again, please. I, I'm trying yeah. to... Re reboot here. Uh, yeah. Um, well, yeah. Can, the, can safe routes to school money be used by colleges or universities or by colleges and universities in conjunction with the nearby schools? Okay. Um, and also, did I stop sharing everybody? Yes, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my, my, my Zoom messed up on me. I'm very, very sorry. Okay. Um, so safe routes, there actually is no new safe routes to school funding. So uh, the better, the, the Safe Routes to School projects under the old Safe Routes to School program were eligible for K through 12 schools only. Now that can include public and private schools, but this, the old Safe Routes to School money is only available K through 12. However, a project for pedestrian and bicycle use a, a college or university, any school of any kind may apply for transportation alternatives funds. It doesn't matter what kind of school you are. And so that does include colleges and universities. You can apply for transportation alternatives funds. Okay, thank you. Um, and then the second question, do all the funding sources being discussed today, uh, do they flow through the state DOT? Uh, Okay, so I'm, well, I guess I'm not screen sharing anymore. I, the program, the uh, guidance does explain that some of these programs are formula programs. The formula programs, for example, are National Highway Performance Program, Congestion Mitigation Air Quality Improvement Program, Surface Transportation Block Grant Program, Transportation Alternatives, Highway Safety Improvement Program, Carbon Reduction. Those are federal highway programs that flow through the state departments of transportation. The, the, the discretionary programs where you would apply either to Federal Highway or to the US Department of Transportation would be uh, scenic byways, active transportation infrastructure investment programs, safe streets and roads for all, 
the Protect Discretionary, the new Reconnecting Neighborhoods program, and uh, the Federal Lands Highways Program funds, those would be administered through our Federal Lands Highway Office. And then Federal Transit Administration, of course, administers Federal Transit Administration programs. Okay, and we have a lot of funding questions. Here's another funding one for you. Uh, the nonprofit sector is very involved in promoting active transportation, i.e. walking, biking, micromobility. Um, this is particularly true in smaller urban areas that don't have transportation authorities. What funding is available to help the nonprofits with operations and capital funds? Uh, Sherry, can you talk about the thriving communities? there and help out with that. I would say one of the, before Sherry does, uh, I recommend that communities look at the DOT navigator that Bernadette mentioned. Uh, but Sherry, can you talk about thriving communities? Yeah, under thriving communities, uh, we there was an effort to really help underserved communities that have not traditionally been served by the state DOTs and the MPOs by offering them uh, direct support in developing grants and in uh, being successful with the grants that they might get. So we are funding uh, service mm -hmm. providers around the country and communities and local governments submitted applications in uh, one of three cohorts uh, to receive support. And all that work is getting underway right now. And I would say, in addition, we have compiled a really nice uh, document on technical assistance. And I think we can uh, post a link to that uh, in the chat as well, that shows the wide variety of technical assistance programs throughout federal government that can provide some form of technical assistance uh, to underserved communities and then just generally to communities. Thank you, Sherry. And, and Barbara has her hand up. She has something additional to add. Or was that an accident? That was an accident. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Um, well, we're going to go back to due consideration and the fact that it applies to all new construction and reconstruction projects. So the question is, does this guidance define what projects constitute reconstruction? Um, the question says, what we sometimes see questions regarding this distinction between reconstruction and other project types, for example, pavement replacement. I'll address that, Bernadette, and I, I responded to it in the Q&A pod already, but um, the guidance doesn't define reconstruction. We do have guidance that we recently sent out to our division offices regarding recon, uh, resurfacing restoration and rehabilitation projects, or 3R, and um, information for them to use when they're reviewing state 3R procedures and considering whether to approve them um, because there's an allowance in the regulation for states to develop 3R procedures for use on the national highway system. Anyway, that guidance, and I put a link in the Q&A uh, chat response, that guidance defines 3R. And reconstruction is basically work that is more extensive than 3R on an existing roadway. So for example, a project to add motor vehicle uh, lanes, maybe go from a two to a four lane road or four to a six lane road, that is a reconstruction project, not 3R. Um, there's a lot of work that is considered 3R. So you may wanna look over at that guidance, see what the 3R definition is, and that'll help you hone in on reconstruction being more significant work than that. All right, thanks very much. Um, and then the next question is, what is Federal Highway's policy on uh, public rights of way accessibility guidance uh, on using that as a guidance? How does that fit in? Anybody wanna take that one? I answered that in the Q&A. Okay. I, I don't um, just that just so everyone could could see it, um, basically agencies are certainly uh, uh, welcome to adopt the ProAg as their local standard, use it as guidance, uh, however they see fit. Um, many agencies have adopted it as a local standard. Uh, we 
hope that the final pro ag rule will be published this year by the U.S. Access Board, and that will be an update to the 2011 uh, draft that that most folks have been referencing. Mm -hmm. um, but until it's adopted by DOT and DOJ as a standard, it's not. It goes back to that discussion we had about what's a standard and what's guidance. It's not a standard until it's adopted by regulation, but certainly is good guidance and um, in many ways the best available best information we have on making rights of way facilities accessible. Um, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Sharon Sider has her hand raised up. Do you want to come off mute and ask your question? I don't think she can, uh, Bernadette, yeah. because uh, she's not among the panel group, but we'll we'll look for any comments they have okay. in the uh, questions pod. Thank you. Well, if you put your question in the in the chat, well, the Q&A section, we'll be able to get to that, hopefully. Um, does federal, here's another question. Does federal highway have any guidance on what's accept, if it's success, <laughs> I'm gonna start again. Does federal highways have any guidance on its acceptability to install more than one type of bicycle facility for a given road? Because inexpensive bike lane retrofits during scheduled roadway resurfacing may not produce an all ages all abilities bikeway. Uh, the locality may only plan for a side path, which is both more expensive and likely to be retrofitted until the road is widened, which will worsen the road for everyone not inside a motor vehicle. So do we have any particular guidance talking about multiple talk types about. of bike facilities? We, I we do have a, uh, I, can, I can jump in on that one. We do have a bikeway selection guide uh, that, that helps, uh, helps with the selection of appropriate facilities uh, in, um, uh, depending upon the circumstance. That's one, one uh, resource. Thank you. And then I think Darren wanted to say something as well. I, I was going to add that um, uh, as part of the Complete Streets effort, we um, published a document early on that sort of ran through some uh, some notional street redesigns. And an ex explicit part of that were scenarios that described agencies perhaps implementing short-term changes that they may be uh, able to do under, say, uh, activities that you implement as part of a, a routine repaving um, and then layering in uh, uh, say more permanent or higher quality facilities as capital budgets might allow and uh, sort of considering that as almost like the life cycle of sort of a complete streets approach uh, to improving a corridor to provide uh, uh, benefits for all users. Um, to the, the, the first part of the question about um, providing two different uh, bicycle facilities on a corridor, while that might not be um, something that that right of way may exist for i know i've seen it in in i've seen it around and i think it's it's consistent with an approach where an agency may identify that there are different users of the roadway who use bicycles who may have different needs and different uh, desires to come out of that so providing two different types of bicycle bicycle facilities and options for those users to traverse the corridor uh, is very consistent uh, with with the approach if uh, if the space exists obviously and is conformant with your local uh, plans uh, and uh, and policies. Very well, thank you, Darren. We have another question. Um, they're ask someone is asking for suggestions on how to handle getting pedestrian features in areas that don't meet the standards, and there is only one or two people that use the roadway that have a disability. I tried to answer that in the Q&A pod. I'm not really sure the first part of the question about don't meet the standards. I, the second part makes me think it means for accessibility. Um, and so in that regard, you know, if there's only one or two users with disabilities, I would just note that the ADA is not predicated on the number of users or the frequency of use. It's if if we provide a facility, a pedestrian facility, it has to be accessible to and usable by individuals with disabilities so as not to be discriminatory. Doesn't matter if it's one person or a thousand people who need to use it. And, you know, people do travel. And so even if you only have one person with a disability living in your community, it doesn't mean someone uh, might not visit. 
uh, your community. So uh, the the usage numbers are really ir irrelevant in the discussion. Thank you. And then, of course, there's always um, people asking, you know, will this be sent to our office? And it has already been sent out. It will also be posted on the PBIC website. So we're just throwing that in. And, and they oh. will have copies of the, and we're not finished. We have copies of the presentation. We'll have uh, this record, this trans, this whole webinar has been recorded too. So just right. to answer some of those questions that have come in in the middle. Yeah, and Bernadette, also, yeah. you know, to answer that question, the guidance is already posted on our Federal Highway website. It was sent to all of our Federal Highway Division offices and to the state DOTs, and I sent it out widely through the Association of Pedestrian Bicycle Professionals. So that was all sent out May 19th. Um, again, it's publicly available on our website. The guidance itself is loaded with links to the design resources. It has a link to the environmental toolkit. It has links to the proven safety countermeasures, the Highway Safety Improvement Program. Um, the guidance is loaded with links to send you to the resources that you need and want, and are, that are wonderful. Well, thank you, Christopher. And then the next question is um, a definition of what we think equity is, and this person wants to know if they're understanding equity correctly. So they said equality, not e equity. Equality should have a place in these conser conservation <laughs> conversations. For example, every community should have access to high quality alternatives uh, to the automobile. This is especially applicable to active transportation. Every community should have access to a well-connected and safe network of bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. So am I understanding equity correctly? So they talk about equality at the beginning and then they said equity. Yeah, let, let me take that one. Um, I think what folks have to think about with equity and if you look at the definition of equity and uh, Google, the, all the work going on at USDOT on our equity action plan, um, you'll see the emphasis on communities that have been underserved and underfunded for a long time, and they are have really been disadvantaged for a long time. So the concept of equity is trying to help catch up in the areas that have had historical discrimination or historical underfunding. Yes, over time, we definitely want to make sure that we get to an equality level. But in this transition period, we've really got some catching up to do. And unfortunately, the fatality numbers and the injury numbers show that there's a disproportionate impact right now to people walking and biking that are black, brown, and of a tribal descent. Uh, so, so the attention, the analysis, the focus uh, we're asking people to put their thumb on the scale and use all the great resources we're putting out to uh, learn about and understand socioeconomic demographics in their area, looking at high injury corridors, um, and put an equity lens over thinking about your uh, decision making and your prioritization scheme. And that's reflected in a lot of the criteria in a number of our grant programs where we're asking folks to do that work and show that the dial, so to speak, is turning with measurable improvements uh, in those communities that have been underserved. Thank you, Sherry. Um, we've been asked for some suggestions on the type of facilities that we can focus on for low population, high speed rural roads, where there aren't any traffic signals or stop signs. Any examples? Um, I, I think it's a little difficult to sort of identify particular facilities, but I, I will note two publications um, that have very specific rural contextual uh, treatments. One is the Small Town uh, and Rural Multimodal Networks Guide that our office put out a number of years ago. Uh, Dan, I'll, I'll shoot down a, I'll shoot a link over to you to put in the chat pod. And that sort of, um, that gets to a few different facilities that may be appropriate for that context. Thank you, Dan, for putting that in. Uh, the other is uh, the bikeway selection guide and a variety of other sort of supplemental uh, publications that uh, the Office of Safety put out specifically for bicycling does uh, offer uh, rural contextual guidance. Um, and then finally, uh, the upcoming uh, AASHTO guide for the development of bicycle facilities uh, does uh, have 
uh, similarly some contextual guidance uh, for the rural context where, uh, frankly, the, the transportation needs and the available rights of way and, and the number of travelers, et cetera, all may be radically different from other contexts. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is, talks about our slides and it said that they all show ample right of way for safe streets, but in older and smaller cities, especially in low income areas, the barriers want to be removed. The homes are built adjacent to a narrow right of way. So to provide the facilities that we describe would require displacement of the homeowners because if the right of way is not wide enough. Can you address that? Yeah, I can I can take a, I can take a stab at it initially and then I, I think I might tag in Elizabeth to, to sort of supplement uh, from a, a design perspective. But I, I think I think a lot of things begin uh, at a local master planning level uh, and sort of saying what are the overall goals uh, for the community, not only in terms of transportation, but in terms of land use and community development. Um, what that what those communities goals and how those are implemented in policy uh, begins to tell us then how we approach on a particular roadway uh, apportioning space and making use of, of discrete right of way to advance the goals of that community uh, to uh, to provide for mobility for everyone. Um, where you see yes. that uh, coming through is a lot of recent research through our National Cooperative Highway Research Program on trade-offs and reapportioning discrete uh, right of way. Um, you'll see that discussed in the forthcoming guide to the development of bicycle facilities that has uh, a very explicit uh, talk about um, uh, basically how to navigate those trade-offs sometimes where you really do have a constrained build to line on a corridor and you have to think about um, how to navigate all of those things. Most of our, our documents, I, I will say, do try to uh, sort of address that, to address the reality that uh, most agencies are not in uh, the mode of building new roadways on a greenfield right of way, but rather, um, rather dealing with a mature system where you're trying to adapt discrete right of way to to meet a lot of different needs. Um, Elizabeth, is there anything I'm I'm missing from a design perspective? No, I think you I think you did a great job. Um, you know, the right of way line may be fixed, but that doesn't mean the roadway has to remain in the same configuration. And a lot of agencies are making progress by reallocating that space in the uh, in the right of way the way Darren suggests you know based on local plans and and uh, to best serve the community. Thank you very much both of you. Um, another question here is is there still a rule of what the percentage of cost for the bike pit accommodation portion versus the overall portion cost for large projects with motorized and non-motorized? Um, I recall an old Federal Highway memo on guidance relating to excessive cost of bike pad facilities included in roadway projects. That's a funding question probably about. I, I actually just heard that mentioned in a meeting I was in today as a very old. Uh, uh, Certainly not standard, in current which law. Is, excuse me? It's not in current law that I'm aware no, of. No, no, not at all. And it, I think I don't think it's been around like since 1991 ago. at least. It's, it's gone. Good to hear that then. Um, the next question is, where do we envision complete streets going in the next 5, 10, 30 years? <laughs> oh, I guess that question might be for me too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, complete streets is a is a nationwide movement with many states having adopted policies in many state and local governments, uh, and uh, they are undergoing implementation. The way that uh, the Federal Highways is engaged is that we are really working to provide implementation resources uh, and to help uh, help state and local agencies uh, with that. Um, we have conducted a survey actually of all the states and where they stand on implementation so that we can better develop uh, technical assistance resources. Uh, we are also looking at our own practices, uh, and you may be aware that we did a, a request for information about how to improve safety assessment across the federal aid system, uh, and we are looking at what actions we can take in our own uh, guidance and procedures to make it easier to uh, include and, and prioritize safety for all users on all projects so that it's not, a, not the sometimes difficult process that it is uh, now. Uh, so we have we have quite a lot of, uh, of activities underway. We have uh, quite a lot of support 
Um, so stay tuned. We have, we do, I think we did give the link to the Complete Streets webpage. It has a lot of great resources on it and you can drill down in three different areas and get some of the answers to some of these questions you've been asking. But Barbara, when you say the 30 year fearless forecast is that um, there's a rebalancing of the prioritization of cars with uh, people who are walking and biking and that the public right away is more balanced and we're it's not we're not pushing mud uphill as much anymore right that it's the that's default, right it's the default approach that's and right Barbara, that's, what, her, that's what we're aiming for working with all of you and uh, working with our state and local partners absolutely Barbara could you talk about the whole vision zero what what's it Barbara, what is the acceptable number of pedestrian and bicyclist fatalities? So, yeah, we really haven't talked about that. Um, it is talked about in the guidance uh, and in other documents. Um, we, the department, not just federal highways, but the department has a goal to get to zero deaths on our uh, roadway system. Uh, and this is part of a, the national roadway safety strategy that was launched by Secretary Buttigieg just about two years ago. Uh, and a big part of that, an implementation piece of that, is uh, the Complete Streets uh, initiative of really looking at the at really improving, uh, creating safer roads and safer speeds. Um, and this this pedestrian and bicycle guidance and uh, all this work is very much a part of that because we have seen this huge increase in pedestrian and bicycle crashes. Uh, that's very concerning uh, and. It's of concern at the highest levels uh, in our uh, department, not just in, again, not just in federal highways. So we are working closely with uh, our other modal partners and with the state DOTs. Uh, your agency, I should say, we have a part of the National Roadway Safety Strategy is a call to action. And we have, um, I think we're nearing 100 uh, organizations that have committed to um, really making safety a, a priority and doing new activities around safety. Uh, so uh, you can look at that and join that call. We can help you uh, as you're figuring out how, how you would like to be part of that movement. So I really encourage you to look at that. We do have a, we'll, we'll post in the chat the, the National Roadway Safety Strategy webpage so that you can see more. You could also keep track of what we're doing. We've made a lot of very specific commitments and there's a dashboard, shouldn't be telling you this, because you're going to get on us for not getting everything done right on time, but uh, we do have a dashboard where you can see every every quarter, every three months, we put up information about what we're doing on the Complete Streets Initiative and on a number of other safety uh, initiatives that we've committed to to get to, to help us get to zero. Well, thank you all, and thank you very much. And I believe there were no questions for Danielle. Danielle, do you have anything else you'd like to add at this moment? <clears throat> Uh, no, other than if you have questions related to micromobility, feel free to reach out to me. We have a quarterly uh, USDOT micromobility working group that meets, and if there's questions that we weren't able to address today, we can definitely take that among the group and, and get some more guidance and work with Christopher and Darren um, in that regard as well. So thank you guys for your time. Well, thank you, and thank you to the, everyone who was presenting today. You did a fabulous job. I know that we didn't get to all the questions that you had. Um, you can continue to post your questions in the chat, uh, in the Q&A section, um, and then we're going to try and come up with some advanced webinars to help you answer some of those questions. There's going to be ample opportunity in the post-webinar survey to share what topics you think are in need of a deeper dive for future webinars and guidance. And the PowerPoint slides and the recording of this webinar will be available on the PBIC website within a few days. And if you have any remaining questions uh, that you really need to answer right away, uh, send those to Christopher Dowes, D-O-U-W-E-S, at dot.gov. And first of all, just let me remind you that Federal Highway is a very robust website with lots of great information. And we've highlighted just three of those links for you on the screen. Um, but we really do want to thank you for joining us today for this webinar. And we hope you found it valuable and got some of the good information that you were hoping for. And I'll turn it over to Dan to close this up. Bernadette, thank you. You covered it all. I just want to say a big thank you to the panel today for all that great information. And thanks to you all for attending. A few times in the chat, I posted a link where you can share your feedback with us. That's how you'll get your certificate of attendance for the webinar. If you don't have time today, that's all right. You'll get an email with all this information and those links tomorrow. Um, so thank you again. We hope to see you next time. Thanks, everyone.